All right. I'm going to head on out. You. Yeah, you're welcome. So we can go ahead and get started. And I'm sure that um, my partner in crime will be joining us again shortly. Um, is everybody comfortable turning on cameras or you don't want to turn on cameras? That way we can quote unquote meet each other. And okay. if you're not, that's okay. It look, looks like he got it set up. He jumped in and uh, gave me presenter control. Okay, good, thanks. So why don't we start with what your um, scavenger hunt uh, orange item was? Do you want to get started, um, Aaron? Sure. Um, mine was honestly not that meaningful. It's just something I had laying around. It's a like an earbud case. Okay. Um, and I got it for doing the 2016 teen summer reading. So I guess it's just significant in that it's convenient to carry stuff and it shows that I'd like to read. What kind of commitment was um, getting it? Was it a certain number of books or a certain number of hours or? I honestly can't remember. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, well, thanks, Erin. Irene, what about you? Were you able to find an orange object to share with us? Um, yeah, so uh, last year, I think, I attended like um, a symposium and it was on the UT campus and I got like an orange lanyard and on the lanyard, I have my permit which is really, really important to me because um, I studied a lot for the test and I think it's so cool to be able to drive with the permit. So that's what I chose, I guess. Fantastic, that's exciting. Yeah. Um, what about Gina? Am I pronouncing your name correct? Yes. Wonderful, what um, is your orange object? I have this chair in my room that is like orange. So um, I guess it's important because it was like the first piece of furniture in this room and it's like not used. It's just there for like display because it's not practical. Yeah. But it's still important because I guess it's, just, it's just there and like it holds like it, it's there for like a few years. So it's important. Wonderful. Um, Lisa, were you able to find an orange object? Hey, um, I'm I'm a teacher here watching my middle school kids. Oh, I cannot <laughs> figure out. I cannot figure out how to turn on my camera. I'm sorry. No worries. But my my it, orange thing that I found was a UT shirt where my son goes. Lovely. And he is in the honors program that he was just talking about. That's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, Lisa, if you hover around the bottom bar, you should see an option to unmute, um, uh, start video, and some other control type things. Um, so it might work. Oh, there you are. Lovely. Uh, Leah, did you find an orange object? I do. I'm going to have to turn my computer and I'm, we'll see if you can see it. Hang on one second. So up there, oh, hang on. I don't know if, can you see the port? The painting of the bulldog uh-huh so he so that was my bulldog and my husband is an artist and and so we got him a ut jersey and he hated wearing the jersey but we had a we took a picture of him and my husband did a painting of him um after he died so i have a painting of my my dog and his ut jersey that he hated <laughs> but people kept saying you know oh there's the georgia bulldog and we we're like no he's a tennessee fan absolutely not <laughs> <laughs> so my orange object, and let's see if you guys can see this. So um, this may just look like a card, but it's actually very meaningful to me. So um, I every year participate in the Lymphoma and Leukemia Light the Night fundraiser um, because I've personally been affected by blood cancer. And the gold thing up here, it well, I personally is in my family, not I. Um, and the gold one up here is for pediatric cancer. And this was my walking group. These are all my friends in New Mexico. Um, and we were able to raise $5,000 that year as just an individual team. And there are so many of us. So all con contributing to a great cause. 
So I will get started with kind of telling you a little bit more about me. Um, were, was everybody in the meeting last week um, where we kind of got a little started? Um, the mentors all introduced themselves. Uh, are you guys familiar with who I am from that? Or do you want me to go back to the beginning? I'm happy to do that as well. I remember you speaking, but I don't remember what you said. <laughs> Okay, so my name is Sandra Pena. I am a graduate student at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, I'm actually remote, so I am lo located in Nashville and um, do most of my classes, well, all of my classes anyways, um, online currently because I work here in Nashville. I work for the Tennessee Department of Health and I am an infectious disease epidemiologist. <laughs> is that exciting, Erin? Okay. Um, so I have worked in public health in numerous places. So I got my start um, in Arizona and I worked as a, um, you know, a communicable disease investigator. So very much a generalist. I worked with all reportable conditions. Uh, and then I went over after I got my MPH or my master's in public health. I went over to the state of New Mexico and I managed a resp uh, resp respiratory disease program for um, the state of Tennessee and did a lot of stuff with influenza and pertussis. I've been here in Tennessee just shy of two years and here I work with the healthcare associated infections team. So if you are seeking care in any regard, the dentist, the podiatrist who, you know, deals with um, toenails, if you are going to the orthodontist or you, for some reason, have to go to the hospital, um, if you get an infection that you are not supposed to get, those are the things my team investigates. So I want to show you a couple of things. If I showed you guys this, would this mean anything to you? COVID. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, it is COVID. So as part of the Tennessee Department of Health, um, one of our responsibilities is public health, you know, so we are stewards of, you know, maintaining health and safety for all Tennesseans. So um, every state has reportable conditions and every state has a little caveat um, that says, you know, anything novel or, um, uh, you know, greatly infectious. So something like a novel flu or anthrax. So it's kind of like the catch all for the things that we don't know that exist yet. So nobody knew that, you know, um, coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2019 um, was going to be a thing before, you know, 2019. So our surveillance and the responsibility to report cases of COVID um, kind of fell into that, you know, last little uh, catchment area that says, hey, it's new, we want to know about it. So in Tennessee, our response for coronavirus started in January. So I don't know if you can recall back to December where there was uh, just, you know, some inklings that something was going on, that a lot of people were getting, you know, very sick with um, maybe flu-like symptoms or very, um, very aggressive pneumonias, and they just didn't know why. So as we started hearing that, and as, you know, our internal leadership started hearing stuff like that, we started our response. We started sourcing materials. So um, personal protective equipment for healthcare providers. We started sourcing, um, you know, uh, contract companies. And if you heard of something called an ACS or an alternative care site, if you guys watch the news with your parents um, on any given night, they'll talk about how COVID is causing so many illnesses that people need to, you know, get care in non-traditional settings. So like the, um, the Nashville, um, 
the Music City Convention Center, that's actually an alternative care site for us here in Nashville. So if we get so inundated, if we get so many patients into um, our hospitals here in Metro Nashville that we're over capacity and we're not able to effectively care for those people, then we start overflowing into these overflow care um, sites that have been previously identified um, and are staffed and are set up with temporary beds and medical supplies and things like that. Um, but I unfortunately broke my leg at the end of December um, of 2019. So I wasn't part of COVID response until March. So I came in and things were already going. Things were, you know, well ramped up and everything. And so I came in um, to COVID response, you know, after things were already getting crazy. And, you know, my team, Healthcare Associated Infections, we normally work with things like this. Does anybody know what my little friend is here? So this giant microbe is MRSA. So this is something that healthcare associated infections epidemiologists deal with all the time. MRSA is an incredibly, um, it's, it's kind of everywhere, um, but it's also referred to as a superbug. So it has a lot of antibiotic resistance and sometimes it's very, very, very hard to treat. Um, but we transitioned as a team to now our focus is um, COVID in healthcare facilities. So if you have a loved one in a nursing home or you have a loved one that gets hospitalized or anything like that, we are helping control outbreaks. We are helping um, facilities um, figure out or initiate infection control plans to um, to get ahead of spread and try and kind of stop spread in those congregate care settings. But it's kept us on our toes because we have over 700 nursing homes in the state of Tennessee. And with a staff of mm, 17, that's, that's a lot more than, you know, any one person can handle. So now at this point in time, we have thousands of employees um, that have come in to help with COVID response. There are contractors that we bring in for short periods of time to help do contact tracing. That might be something you, you've heard a lot of in um, the media. But all this because this little itty bitty virus that's just causing us all sorts of problems. So, and that might be a little on the large side, so let me bring it smaller again. But so this is the cell structure of COVID. And um, you know how they ha have kind of referred to it as that the virus has a crown? That's referring to these light green things on the outside, the spike glycoproteins, because it kind of looks, you know, like a crown. Um, but when we look at um, viruses, one thing that makes them really challenging is that we can't treat them with antibiotics. Um, and uh, what's been a big problem with COVID is that it's very, um, the, the symptoms are pretty generic. So in cold and flu season, if you have a fever and a cough, that could be a cold, that could be flu, or that could be COVID. So a lot of people, you know, um, go to the worst case scenario and automatically think that it's COVID because yes, COVID is very prevalent currently and it wouldn't be shocking for it to be COVID, but um, you know, you can still get regular sick, which is something that we've had to remind a lot of people in the community. But some of my other friends that I brought tonight, does anybody know what this little guy is? So this is Ebola. So um, I, so the Ebola in 2014, I was um, just, mm, I think I was a year and a half into my master's program um, for my master's in public health. I didn't get to do too terribly much with that, but what about this guy? 
he's Stachybotra. So have you ever heard about black mold? So that's this little guy. How can somebody so cute be so dangerous? Um, what about my friend here? What are these little things? Does anybody know? So these are flagella. This is kind of like what lets them, you know, project and move around um, to get where they're wanting to go. So this little guy is mobile and can cause a lot of damage. He is salmonella. So a uh, foodborne um, enteric disease that uh, is very common in the summers. And when I lived and worked in New Mexico, these two were two of my um, pathogens that I was subject matter expert for. So this guy over here, he's flu. And this guy over here, he's pneumonia. But what you're seeing in, um, in all of these things is that viruses and bacterias have shapes. And um, as you can continue in your science career, things like this will keep making a reoccurrence. So what does this guy look like? Probably looks like this right over here, huh? Or bringing back my little MRSA friend over here, huh? And where'd my pneumonia go? You see how this one kind of looks like a pair of cocci just kind of on its side, but upright here. Oh, and this one, he's somebody you don't want to mess around with. He's anthrax. So um, over my career so far, I've collected a lot of the gyrant microbes, even though they're um, many, many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, the time, uh, times the size of what the organism is in real life. Um, it's just kind of fun to, you know, remember, you know, the organisms that I'm working with and the difference that I'm making um, in public health and in the health of our community. Do you guys have any questions? Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about science fair projects. Uh, has anybody had some time to consider um, what they want to do for a project or um, does anybody have any interests in particular that they want to talk about that could become a science fair project? So if I can go first. Sure. Um, I was thinking of not doing science for this year, but the symposium, the Tennessee Junior Symposium for the Human Nation Sciences, which I guess is pretty similar to Tyson anyway, but the reason why I was like, oh, like uh, earlier, because my topic idea was in regards to analyzing COVID-19. And I was going to look at like how the, because Tennessee, I think is a pretty, can be a pretty good example, of, like urban rural divide. Absolutely. Um, Right, and then ask, use the information um, that's available for public domain to just kind of look at several factors and analyze whether urban places or rural places are truly like COVID hotspots. Um, so that was just something I was thinking. If you, since you're like an expert on that matter, have any ideas regarding like directionality? Let, I'm trying to pull up an email that I just recently got. Um... Let's see if anybody else wants to go um, and just kind of give an overview and then we'll dig deeper into each one of these topics while I try to find that email for you, Erin. Um, Gina, do you have an idea of what you might possibly want to work on or do you want to um, try and pull together some ideas today with us on the phone? Um, I don't have like a really clear idea. I just know that I probably want to be more survey based. So I was like wanting to ask questions about like the survey like requirements, like all the like the forms or like how the IRB and all of that would work. Yeah, so um, you're definitely on the right track. So something 
that's survey-based where you're going to have to talk to people could be considered human research. So you would definitely want to run by, um, you know, your, what, what would be your population group? Do you know anything more specific than survey-based? I would say like students my age and like also just like high school students and college students like across the U.S. On what topic though? Um, I haven't really decided. Okay. Do you have a couple of ideas or do you want to try and refine that with us tonight on the phone? I think I can, I'd be willing to refine it. Okay, perfect. So we'll circle back. Um, Irene, what about you? Do you have any ideas? Um, so I don't know if this has to be based in human sciences, but absolutely not. Okay, so um, we did a bunch of labs in bio this year, and we're going to continue doing them. But I remember the most like, I don't know, interesting one for me had to do with like yeast and how it ferments and what kind of products it produces. So I think it would be a cool experiment to try um, changing up some variables like changing the sugar source or increasing the temperature by a significant amount and seeing how the yeast react. But that's just, that's just like the very general idea. I would probably want to like refine it or maybe come up with something totally different. It's just a, like a rough draft at this point. I think you're on to a fantastic start. Um, I uh, am taking a mycology course this semester that unfortunately comes to an end here in, you know, like another seven days or so. Uh, but our professor was saying that, you know, usually when she offers the class in the fall, that she does a Thanksgiving themed last class around, you know, Thanksgiving, where it's all the foods and drinks that um, come from, you know, yeast based products and um, things that require um, fermentation and things like that. And we're all a little bit sad that we're all doing COVID distance learning because we don't get to partake in that. But, you know, it's a fantastically interesting topic. And you, I think you're on to a great start. Um, any thoughts, questions right now or keep going? Andrew, I wanted to ask you how or does your program interact with, with, with these potential vaccines coming out? Do you all look at that or are you just in a separate field of study? Well, funny you should say, I have been recently voluntold that I am going to be the project coordinator for a vaccine effectiveness study that we are doing in partnership with Vanderbilt Medical Center and with CDC. So I am... Um, I don't get the title of PI um, because somebody more important th than me um, within my organization gets that, but that's essentially my role within Tennessee Department of Health. While um, Vanderbilt has a PI representing, um, you know, their institution because they're going to be the acute care hospital that's participating. And we are going to focus our efforts at Tennessee Department of Health in a large nursing home because we just wanna be representative of Tennessee and representative um, across, you know, the gamut of ages and genders and, um, you know, race, even though sometimes that's a little bit harder to be representative of here um, in Tennessee. I've done a lot of medical record abstraction where, you know, everybody's been Caucasian. And I was like, that is so fantastically interesting in a way, because I'm from Arizona where, you know, there you're going to get a whole mixed bag. Um, but yes, so soon to come, we are working on our IRB. So don't think that we're making you guys do IRBs and we don't have to do those every day because we do a lot of those. A lot of what we do has to do with human subjects or um, we don't do a lot of uh, animal um, based things at the Tennessee Department of Health. But I guess what I didn't mention earlier is that there's so many different kinds of epidemiologists that you can be. So I'm infectious disease, but um, somebody that would deal with my friend Stachybotra here, that could be an environmental health epidemiologist or, you know, um, specifically salmonella 
we have foodborne epidemiologists. So even though they're still kind of infectious, but they're kind of not, but we also have um, injury prevention epidemiologists. We have, um, you know, everything that you can think of, um, there could be an epidemiologist role for that, you know, because a lot of what we do is getting out into the community and educating, but we're also trying to research to understand the problem. So if we understand the problem better, then we can tailor our intervention to meet what the community need is. Does that make sense? So do you feel like you live in a science fair? Can I choose not to answer? <laughs> Um, my life is chaos currently. I uh, often wonder how I do it. Uh, um, poor Bonnie uh, only. She's my mycology professor. Um, she has been on the ups and downs with me because there have been times where I'm like, I cannot do another month of COVID response and not lose my mind. So it is... It has been a journey, but it has also been so beautiful to see how people have come together because I like, I'm not an emergency prepared, pre repaired, emergency preparedness epidemiologist or a disaster epidemiologist, but for all intents and purposes, this is that, you know, so we've all been pushed really far outside of our comfort zone and our bubble. And we've had to learn a lot of things on the fly. Um, and we've had to be really adaptable. Um, but knowing that it's okay to ask questions and that if you don't know, somebody does, uh, and being comfortable asking those questions, we'll get through it. Just Jennifer, I want to interrupt for just a second. Um, the questions that you guys had about IRBs, if you if you have specific questions, once you get your experiment formulated, uh, I'm always available to, to answer those questions and just go to the ISIF rules and see where uh, what what forms you have to fill out. But if you have questions, you can always uh, contact uh, Jason and he can get all the questions to me. Okay. okay. Perfect. We appreciate that, Kim. Thanks. Um, so Aaron, circling back to um, your project. So some really interesting research uh, recently came out about mask usage. Um, so it was a Vanderbilt study and it was about um, mask usage in, um, uh, in communities with mask mandates versus mask usage in communities where it's highly encouraged but not required. And then mask usage in counties where there was no mask mandate. And so this was um, just like a line graph. And you could see that in um, the counties that had no mask mandate, that cases just, you know, did this straight vertical kind of, kind of climb. So um, they're looking into research like that every single day. And it's incredibly interesting because, you know, wearing a mask is so, um, uh, it's such a divisive kind of, you know, topic at this point in time where some people feel very passionately one way or the other. And um, it's kind of hard to tiptoe that line. Um, so what are your thoughts, you know, um, because rural communities versus urban communities, this is the perfect part of the country to do that in. Perfect. Yeah, so that's a really interesting article. Um, if you could maybe send it to me. Sometime. I got to look for it in my disaster of an email box, but as soon as I find it, I will share it with Jason and I'm sure that Jason can get it to you. Okay, perfect. Um, so my thoughts are basically, well, since it, so like it, one might argue in an urban setting, since like the population density is so high, it's easier to not use a communicated disease. And then in rural, like you said, with the mask mandate, if people are more relaxed about that kind of stuff, it can also spread a lot. So I was just kind of going to try to look at some graphs, like you just said, and then just figure out whether um, urban places or rural places were truly like the COVID hotspots. And then from there, um, go and examine like specific factors. So like socioeconomic factors or just like environment factors and then see how those play into making that conclusion. 
that was my idea, but I'm not sure how applicable that is right now since COVID is like an ongoing and relatively new thing. So something that's very interesting and something that you'll learn about science is that um, we publish things as we know things. So, you know, a paper that got published in June may not be as applicable today um, in October, November, it's November, <laughs> um, in November that it was, you know, five months ago. So, you know, if, if you are, you know, um, creating good science and good data, um, you know, people publish stuff that goes out of date just as fast as it gets created all the time. Um, so I don't think that you would need to worry about that. Um, but what are you thinking about, like what your data source would be? How, how would you get the information to put something on a line graph? So I know that, um, like, just like the State Department of Health and just like the U.S. Census Bureau and other public like institutions have a lot of data available. I haven't done too much research into specific, like the specific kinds of data that are available. So I definitely have to look into that. But um, I think as far as like graphics go, um, I'm not sure how I do a line graph. I'm sure I could create like a map. Um, and then highlight which areas, like like a state map, and which areas are more hot spotty, or which areas are influenced by different factors, um, and just create a map like that rather than like a graph with like numbers. Yeah. So your homework assignment is to Google what a chloropleth map is. Could you spell that? Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, C L O R. O P L E T H. I think okay. I spelled that correctly. Okay. Um, but let me show you this real quick. Doo, doo, doo. So you can avoid IRB if you use publicly available data. So this is the Tennessee Department of Health website. And if you click on the gold bar, it's going to direct you to Tennessee specific data. Perfect. And that's if this wants to open. Okay, here we go. So um, if you click on any one of these tiles, there's all sorts of information about um, uh, COVID, but here we go. Epidemiology and surveillance data. So there, here is some publicly available data that you can use that's already de-identified. So you wouldn't run the risk of, you know, identifying Sandra Pena in Davidson County as being somebody that has COVID. If, if the data you're using can identify a specific person, you've got a problem. <laughs> yeah, you need to make sure that that's de-identified because um, then you could run into um, a lot of problems. So that's some place where you can look to kind of dig a little bit deeper. All right. Um, quick question. Do you have any like specific factors or just things in, that you would think would be, would work for like a good research, either question or paper, like something specific that would point research in a direction that's not just like super broad? So I'm going to turn the question back on you. Um, what do you, what is the question you want to answer? Like what so, do you, what problem can you come up with that needs answering? Well, my main question was kind of in two parts. It was, are either urban places or rural places the true kind of places where COVID is thriving the most? And once I get that result, what factors lead to that conclusion? Like, why is that true? Okay. Um, so what I'm thinking, what pops to mind, um, would be population density. Um, so if you think just off the top of your head about the differences between urban and rural environments is there's going to be a lot more people in one of them. <laughs> um, so there's that, but something that's getting a lot of, uh, interest right now is, you know, colder weather means people are going indoors. So socioeconomic status um, and household makeup, 
you know, versus, you know, Sandra lives alone in her apartment. So, you know, it's, I'm not at risk of exposing anybody at home um, versus there's a household that's multi-generational and it has grandma and grandpa, mom and dad, and then a couple of kids. So that would be like a much higher risk setting because maybe the kids are in school, maybe the parents work, you know? Um, so there's a lot of potential um, opportunities for introduction of, you know, uh, virus into the home. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes. So absolutely the population density, thank you. Um, but I was wondering if like the, the whole, like, what you just said about the people living in one house, et cetera. Is that data available? Uh, um, so there's some census tra track data available. Um, let me see how, uh, because people do whole master's thesis on socioeconomic status and um, household makeup. And that may be a little more than what you're aiming for for this particular project, but it's good information to expose you to. Um, but I believe through Harvard, they have census track level data available and um, the Census Bureau um, so they do a census every 10 years. So you could get data from there um, about um, SES or so socioeconomic status. That would be an option. So between today and our next meeting in December, try to, you know, we have three minutes. I need to talk to Gina a little bit. Sorry. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Try, try to put some, some thoughts on paper about ways to approach this project. Okay. I'm so and sorry. And real quick on the census data, just keep in mind that we have a census this year and you're dealing with information that's about 10 years old. Yeah. There. Gina, let's talk a little bit more about your project. Um, and you guys are welcome to send questions to Jason um, and um, Dr. Gwen, and they can get me those questions. So we can talk ahead of um, ahead of our next meeting, but in a more structured environment, not like on a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing. Um, Gina, thoughts? questions, concerns, anything that you want to ask to kind of refine your topic a little bit? This one is, it's, um, my, like, my questions are mainly, like, right now I have, because I haven't signed a topic, are just more, like, technical, like, just sorting out how the surveying, like, those logistics, mm -hmm. like, because, like, I don't know if, like, I have to, like, get, like, consent, because, or, like, like, because I'm just, like, sending out the surveys like my friend do they have to like do I have to like reveal their like can it be like an anonymous survey or sure. like Absolutely. Um, but one thing that you need to remember that you want a representative sample. So if you're only going to ask people in your friend group, you are going to bias your research. So you have to think um, of how you can. So if what what grade are you in? 12. Okay, so, you know, um, if your 12th grade has 350 students, try to get a representative sample of the 350 students that are in 12th grade at your high school versus um, if you have, so if you have what is referred to as a really small N, which is, you know, the population that you're working with. So if you survey 20 people out of 350, um, your data isn't going to be as valuable. So you just want to um, think hard about how would you deploy that survey? Would it be something um, that you are going to provide a link to your high school, um, you, to your high school students, your fellow students, or, um, you know, there's numerous online platforms like SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics that you can create a survey in. Um, so, you know, in 2020, everybody has 
just about everybody has access to a computer either at work or at home um, and internet. So uh, like access to the survey shouldn't be a big deal, but um, designing a survey sometimes is really challenging because you want to make sure that you're asking meaningful questions so that the question is um, just structured, um, just structured appropriately to get the right answer, if that makes sense. So you really need to drill down on what your research question is before we start thinking about how we're going to design your survey. Um, is it possible if like I come up with a few research ideas and like send them to you and like you like look at which one you think would be better for like like doing research on? Absolutely. I'd be happy to help you with that. Um, just make sure that you send it to Jason and um, you can, in, yep, Jason, who just right. popped into our room, <laughs> and he can get me any sort of, you know, communication. Um, and, you know, Dr. Gwen and I can get together and um, maybe give you some feedback ahead of next month's meeting. Hey, great. Just a uh... Quick note, we're just a minute or two past eight. So just wrap up, finish up here, and sure. then um, feel free to log off. But I'm not, not trying to not trying to rush you all. Okay. Um, real quick, Irene, um, do you have something you want to focus on before we get off the line? Um, I don't really know what my independent variable is going to be. But I think it would be really cool to kind of be geared towards like a certain end result, like um, maybe bread. <laughs> maybe I could focus on like how the bread tastes or if I was just keeping it in a liquid solution, uh, what causes it to smell distinctly different from something else. I, I really don't know. Those are just like rough drafts, <laughs> like I said before. So definitely between now and next month, think a little bit more about what, um, you know, what specific mold maybe you want to look at or um, what yeast you want to look at and then see what, um, what are, where that um, yeast or mold is present. And um, then you can say it doesn't necessarily have to be bread. It could be a lot of other, you know, potential um, sources. Um, there's a couple of things. Um, if there's not any other questions right now, there's a couple of things that I need to give you guys reminders of before we get off the phone um, or the Zoom. Um, but we all want to thank you for being part of Science Club. Um, something like this wouldn't be possible without you guys. Um, to remind you guys, uh, the dates for SACEF are March 29th and 30th. Registration is now open at uh, SACEF. So S is in Sam, A is in Apple, S is in Sam, E is in Edward, S is in, or F as in Frank, dot UTK dot EDU. Um, please invite your friends to the next meeting. Um, that meeting is December 1st at 7 p.m. And the speaker will be Dan Hurst from Strategy. Um, He's my boss, by the way. And he won the science fair and went to <clears throat> the international science fair. And it's what allowed him to go to college, the scholarship that he won. Oh, that's so fantastic. Because college is expensive, guys. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, any last questions? I don't want you guys to feel like I'm rushing you off the phone, but I also want every to be respectful of everybody's time um, if they have other things that they need to do this evening. I think you answered all of my questions and I just want to say um, thanks for being here and like kind of guiding us in the right direction and showing us like your stuffed animals or like the stuffed, <laughs> the stuffed I am Viruses. aware that I am an adult with stuffed animals and I'm, I'm okay with that. I've seen the, the, like the internal organ ones, but I've never seen the infectious disease. They're stuff. so cute. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. I'm what sorry. What about this guy? I didn't show you. This is Nagleria phalari. This is a brain eating amoeba. Yeah. Sorry. I've got. <laughs> 
there's things wrong with me, but I really love science and I'm really glad that you guys are here um, and that you're interested in human sciences. There's so many um, career paths and there's so many options um, that uh, being part of this particular area of science, um, so many places it can take you. So I'm excited to be part of your journey with you. Any questions? If not, we will end the recording. And I look forward to chatting with all of you guys in December. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good Thank night, you. everybody. Bye. Thank you.